being said, I want to dive into um, into a more specific area here by talking about the Arizona U.S. Senate race. So this is from the Center Square. So it says the Democrat Congressman Ruben Gallego, Republican Pinal County Sheriff Mark Lamb, and Independent Cinema. Wow. Senator Kirsten Sinema uh, released their quarter two fundraising numbers in Arizona Senate this week, which paints a clearer picture of the race in its early days. Gallego raised $3.1 million in the quarter, which runs from April 1st to June 30th, whereas Lamb raised over 607000 The Democrat entered the race in January, and he's quickly accumulated a war chest. Lamb waited till Friday to release his numbers, which also show that he has 335,000 in cash on hand and spent over 272,000. Notably, his wife, Janelle Lamb, was paid nearly 5,000 by the campaign for strategic strategic consulting and mileage costs. So um, actually, I do want to keep going here just a little bit more. Um, Lamb is the only one in the race for the Republican nomination, which has arguably come to a standstill as former gubernatorial candidate Carrie Lake has continuously said she is considering a bid to replace cinema. So um, there's more to that article. I'm just kind of giving you the, the uh, brief breakdown. But the Senate race is another opportunity here for us to pick up some ground on the federal level all through the same state of Arizona that we've been focused so heavily on tonight. Um, one of the things that I found interesting specifically about the setup, uh, first and foremost, we do see the, uh, uh, the discrepancy between the fundraising. Uh, obviously, our opponent is much more uh, well-funded than, uh, uh, than um, Lamb. But ultimately, something that I, I wanted to, I guess, ask um, both of you, um, Gavin and Austin, and of course, Will, you're welcome to chime in here as well. Um, but it, it did talk about Carrie Lake wanting to um, potentially throw her hat in the ring for the Senate. Um, now, I love Carrie Lake, and I think that she would be a great senator, of course. I really see her more being executive, at least with the way that I've seen her um, campaign. Um, but ultimately, it did make a point to say that uh, that thing kind of slowed down with her sort of tiptoeing the idea of should she or shouldn't she step into the race. So my thought is that I think Carrie just needs to either announce or choose to abstain because it seems like this is potentially hurting lamb's ability to fundraise right now i mean austin is that anywhere accurate do you think well uh, yeah i can agree to a part of it um but you know mark lamb great guy good conservative he's done really well for our state here as a sheriff um runs his department really well really an upstanding guy but that's a high burn rate and um if i was on the campaign if i was his consultant or his campaign manager i would say we have a problem here regardless if Carrie Lake is jumping into this race or not that we don't know. Um, we just spent a lot of money on a guy that, you know, has somewhat of a good name ID within the Republican Party already in Arizona. Uh, I don't know who his consultants are, um, but that's pretty high to be spending that much money after he's only been announced for a few months. So in my opinion, that's kind of unacceptable. Mm -hmm. But really, in Arizona, like we're talking about, you know, the mechanics of the state between Gallego. Like, Gallego's going to raise 30, 40 million. Cinema's going to raise 30, 40 million. She's going to have a lot of the corporate money come behind her. She's already got name ID. She's won before. Gallego is, is the left's darling in Arizona and within the party. He's had Pelosi come out here and uh, raise some money for him. But at the end of the day, Ronald Reagan and uh, Richard Nixon could be on the ballot and we'll probably still lose Arizona regardless of who is the Senate nominee right now because we don't have the mechanics. And so the reason I say that is because, you know, Mitch McConnell has already signaled that he is not going to spend money on a MAGA Republican if it becomes the Republican nominee for the Senate in Arizona. That's a problem. So what that does is it signals to establishment donors in the state that I'm not going to give money to Carrie Lake if she becomes the nominee. So you could have you could have donors that are saying, well, maybe if you know, I don't know how many exactly, but the fact of the matter is is that you know Carrie Lake and Katie Hobbs, two completely different candidates when they ran for governor this last right. time. Katie Hobbs never campaigned, extremely unpopular. She won on the margins. This is going to be a three-way race. You know, Cinema's going to have 40 million. Gallego's going to have 30, 40 million. Our Republican nominee is going to need the same amount of money. But if they have that same amount of money and there still isn't that infrastructure, that outside support, that mechanics here to chase ballots, to have our own team of Mark Eliases, we're not going to win. Mark Lamb is a good candidate. I think Mark Lamb could probably win in this three-way race. I think Kerry Lake could win in this three-way race if we have the mechanics in place and possible. Uh, Republican turnout's going to go up. If Donald Trump, if and when Donald Trump becomes the Republican nominee, that's just a fact. That's that's what the numbers are going to point to. Um, you know, I can tell you from personal experience being in the legislature. So I'm in the Arizona Freedom Caucus. We know we're, we're a third of the Republican members in the Arizona House and the Senate. 
um, we have been able to, you know, we've, we've been talking about, um, you know, the election stuff that we've done, the legislation that we've done really did really did well this last cycle because we put Katie Hobbs on the defensive um, being, you know, rabble rousing freshman legislators in the Freedom Caucus, more conservative populist types compared to other times in the past, really taking back that ground. The, the, the stage that we set in 2024 to play offense regarding elections, voter registration, PAC, you know, uh, PAC support, C4 support, what the legislature does really is going to have to be a uh, rising tide lift all boats. What the what Gavin spoke about this earlier, the left is always finding ways, um, to, you know, to test the waters, to dump a million into this state, to dump a million. They're willing to put, you know, uh, their, their C4s and their PACs and their NGOs and their nonprofits off to the side with, you know, 10 or 15 million. And they said, you know what, we're going to target three or four smaller legislative districts in Arizona with a million dollars in outside spending. Hopefully they're having a rising tides lift all boats. We're missing that in states like Arizona. We're missing states like that in Nevada, because if we get that kind of stuff, it's, it's a perfect storm for our nominee. Right. And so whether it's Mark Lamb or Carrie Lake, if we don't have that rising tides lift all boat mentality, we're going to have a very hard time. And so this, these right. races are going to be one on the margin. I want to bring up something else that we, we were talking about that, that Will was taught that Will mentioned that, you know, it's, it's kind of disgusting and discouraging that we're at this point right now. But the fact of the matter is, is that we have other establishment Republicans and moderate Republicans and the mainstream Republicans like David Schweikert, perfect example, who, you know, for the longest time in Arizona was a more conservative member when he was, you know, first came into the Freedom Caucus in the House. He left the Arizona or the, the House Freedom Caucus because he blamed the local Arizona Freedom Caucus. He said that we were too populist. We were too conservative. Well, really, that's, you know, kind of like, you know, uh, kicking the can down the road, trying to blame somebody else from from your mistakes. You can't have Republicans running for office attacking the conservative base. A mm. perfect example is, is this woman named Shauna Bullock, who was a state house representative, ran for secretary of state this last time, lost the primary to Mark Fincham. She just got recently appointed back to the state Senate for a resignation and attacked the Arizona Freedom Caucus. You can't have your candidates attacking the Republican base. And this is yeah. something that has happened to many, many candidates across the country that we cannot afford anymore. Because in the past, you know, the establishment would win a Republican primary and conservatives, we would, okay, we would dust ourselves off and we would get back in line to, you know, you know, vote for the guy with the R. The establishment doesn't do the same exact thing for the conservatives when we win the primary. And so my biggest fear is that in Arizona, Carrie Lake becomes the nominee. They're going to do that again because they did leave her out to dry. They left Blake Masters out to dry. They left Abe Hominay out to dry. They left Mark Fincham out to dry. And so unless the conservative base, we have to be the ones to win these elections by the margins, ballot chasing, um, you know, poll watching, poll observing, volunteering, everything that we can do to win these races, because cinema is going to have that army. Diego is going to have that army. We're going to have to continue to build it from the grassroots up here in Arizona. And the last thing I'll mention is, you know, Gavin talking about what they did in New York, you know, taking back the House ran through New York 100 percent. United States Senate will likely not run through Arizona. It will go through other states. It will have mm -hmm. to go through other states because the, le the, 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 re the Republican establishment has so much vitriol and hate for conservative. And especially here in Arizona, because it was controlled by John McCain, the Koch right. brothers and Doug Ducey for the longest. Doug Ducey alone spent $100,000 propping up my opposition in outside spending in the Republican primary. So they're willing to take their ball, their ball and go home. And so that's, you know, really got to think here. You know, just because we get Kerry Lake nominated doesn't mean we're going to win or Mark Lamb because right. the Republican establishment has proven time and time again. If you nominate a MAGA or a conservative, a, you know, traditional conservative, a populist, they will leave you out to dry. And so we have to mentally prepare ourselves that we're going to be spending, you know, hopefully 12, 13 hours a day as grassroots people chasing these ballots or we're not going to win whether we have the money or not. Hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. Hmm. Will, did you want to respond? I know you were mentioned there. So, yeah. Um, thank you guys. And, and earlier, I can't remember what it was in response to, but earlier I was thinking that in between the 1970s and the 1980s, there was a giant shift that happened in American culture when we went from a culture of producers to a, a culture of uh, consumers. That was the big shift that happened from 1970 to 1980, uh, especially with the arrival of Ronald Reagan and, and a lot of the outsourcing of manufacturing to China. And so everything that's evolved in the past, say, 40 or so years has been an emphasis on the American consumer, not the American producer. And I look at a lot of these uh, con a lot of these Republicans who are attacking the conservatives as part of that 
emphasizing the American consumer, not the American producer, which means that they have to be allied to international interests. And they abandon the American small business owner, they abandon the American middle class voter in favor of these internationalist interests. And that's the biggest tragedy to see is, is a lot of the highest profile, quote, Republicans not actually caring about the everyday concerns of the American people. And we saw it with Mike Pence, right? Well, that's not my concern. Like, <laughs> bro, what? <laughs> like, that was lovely. That was wild. That was absolutely wild. And so I, I guess the, the distinction that I wanted to introduce around the word Christian, and maybe this can help introduce some subjects to how we can think about this, is I'm reading this book right now. This is just the dust jacket because the book's in the room, uh, The Toxic War on Masculinity by Nancy Piercy. This is a great book, uh, just getting into. And she has a distinction in here around the word Christian. And what she says, and, and this is around, um, it's around uh, domestic abuse statistics. There's a, there's a narrative that runs in, in the public about how Christian households are the most abusive, et cetera. And what actually, when you piece that apart, what you find is that the, the households of, of, of Christian fathers who attend church regularly, like three or more times a month, actually have the, have the lowest rates of domestic abuse in the country, the highest rates of marital satisfaction, the highest rates of sexual satisfaction in a marriage. So this, but meanwhile, on the other side, you see the exact opposite with quote unquote nominal Christians, people who identify as Christians, but don't actually put their faith into practice. Hmm. The faithful Christians who attend church and are involved regularly in the church are actually the core of the, of the American Christian faith. And those are the ones that we want to bring up and cultivate. And I think one of the things, um, one of the things that seems so striking is that the interests of those voters are exactly 180 degrees opposite of the interests of the left. Abortion is a great example. So finding candidates that are willing to run on the issues that those Christian voters care about, the true heartbeat of America kind of people, I think that'll be key to any candidate winning. And I think that speaks to a lot of Trump's success was that he was willing to, he's willing to make that, they called it a deal, but he delivered on the deal. And so maybe right. candidates that are willing to activate and speak to the things that I care about will be the key. And of course that will be hated by the Republican establishment, but maybe there's a way forward with that. It's a lot about what Austin was saying about, uh, or actually it was Gavin that was saying this about, uh, the, the left, they, they repay their own. Yeah. Um, you know, I think, I think Trump, I mean, cause if we're just being super blunt, I don't think Trump is, or at least was super pro-life. I mean, the reality is he was no. a Democrat his whole, his whole life. You know, he did, he did kind of talk, he had a bit of a conversion story when he learned a little bit more about the science behind it, as a lot of people have over the past, you know, 15, 20 years. But still the reality is I think Trump was not, you know, necessarily a staunch, um, you know, abolitionist, but he was willing to put proper conservative um, uh, justices on the Supreme Court. Well, you know, he, was, he delivered to his base. That's ultimately what I'm getting at here. He delivered on multiple fronts, but please, either of you jump I was in. talking to someone earlier today. I mean, it's just a lot of, you know, the old institutional, even so-called conservatives, but institutional Republicans. I mean, they, you know, George Bush would call in to the uh, to the March for Life and people would right. be like, oh, my God, he called in. We can't believe and Trump George actually Bush. went. Trump went and like they held these old Republicans to such a different standard. That, you know, oh, Bush is elected. We have the Congress. We're, we're going to get something done. We're going to pass an amendment. We're going to repeal Roe. And it went like that, you know, pre-Bush went like that for how many decades? Two, three, four decades that we were they were talking about this. And it was like, oh, the Republicans are going to deliver. The Republicans are going to deliver. And, you know, they said all the right things. And that was part of like the whole bargain that they had with these neoconservatives and the evangelicals or their social cons. They said, don't worry, don't worry. We'll we're going to we're going to take care of you. We're going to get these things taken care of. You know, just keep voting for us, keep donating to us and keep sending your sons to die overseas. But we'll we'll certainly get to the abortion issue any minute now. And Trump comes on the scene. And I think, you know, I think it's fair to say what you just said, that he wasn't exactly a social conservative by any means, you know, coming through this. I think he was a traditionalist. I think he's a and I think there's a distinction. There. I think he has a lot of traditional values, uh, but I don't necessarily think he was like a very socially conservative guy. But I think he evolved. And at the end of the day, he delivered. He got it done. And despite that, you still you still see people coming after him like he wasn't good enough. And they, they attack him from the right when he was the one that actually delivered on these things. And then they're trying to find ways to undercut it and to diminish it and all the rest. And I just think it's so disingenuous. And it just goes to show the vitriol that, that Austin was alluding to. There's such vitriol 
in the party ranks right now from, you know, our side to theirs, their side to us, that it, it, it it's more vitriol internally than it is externally towards the Dems and the left. And the Dems and the, lo- the left love it. And they're, they're certainly fueling the flames when they can. Uh, but they're certainly also trying to make examples. And that's what the establishment does. They purposely try to, you know, subvert mm-hmm. and sabotage candidates and movements and then say, see, we told you guys, you should have listened to us. You yeah. lost your race, even though we spent no money. We did nothing to help you. And we actively tried to hurt you. But listen, we got you. You guys should have just been moderates and you would have won. And that's never how it works. And then when they do win, then they still find another excuse. And it's a never ending, you know, narrative formation and counter narrative formation that they try to engage in to push back. But I also love what Will said uh, about the sort of consumerist society. I think that's absolutely true. I think this is a really macro level topic. But it's absolutely fundamental that we have shifted from being a producer, a producing country to a consuming country. And with that, it's not just the economic implications. It is the cultural implications, the spiritual implications. You know, we're seeing, you know, we're seeing this sort of runaway capitalism and people are just they they don't have anything but platitudes. And I'm a capitalist. I'm a free market guy, but they don't have anything but platitudes about the free market. And then we're saying, well, what we're seeing right now is this sort of cultural degeneration and uh we're seeing just like this hedonistic lifestyle take hold and it's sh- and you can't have a free society you can't have this republican form of government with these with these values with these rights with this constitution with this bill of rights if your whole cultural and religious fabric is completely sunk and and turned to mush um these things matter and they they don't they're not easy to quantify you know you can't quantify all of these types of these types of things that make a society healthy and make a society robust and allow a society to be high trust and allow a society to be able to sustain itself and its institutions. It's hard to quantify and it's not always going to fit in into a pure, you know, economic theorem of supply and demand, but these things matter. The founders understood that they talked about it. And and I think we've lost that in the conservative movement over the years, because we've moved from a movement that's talking about conserving things, conserving a tradition, conserving a lifestyle, conserving an American way of life, conserving all these these kind of you know harder to define non-tangible things and we've turned into exclusively a party that only talks about you know gdp in the chamber of commerce yeah. it's become the chamber of commerce republican party uh that has been promoting things and you know i saw twitter threads today talking about you know things like the first place the second place and the third place first place is your home second place is your job and third place is something else and i think that's something that americans have lost because it's really just been kind of like this you know uh, race, rat race to the bottom consuming society all consuming uh with nothing else mattering and i think that's a kind of a big impetus for problems we're facing today I saw your tweets about the third place, and I really appreciated you digging into that because we've lost a sense of community in America. Where where do we as people go to gather, to be with each other and talk rather than engaged in some other activity like watching a sports game? Like where can we go to meet each other? And for the work that I do, where can men go to meet with other men right. in, in male-only environments? I think those that's another thing we've lost. The fraternal organizations, you know, got killed and died. And, it's, and you, yeah. you, see, you used to see, I mean, in New York, I mean, New York used to be, you know, all of these different clubs and these organizations. I mean, every there was something for everybody, and it was sort of part of the fabric. And people, you know, even in my club, you know, because it's such an old club, hundred years ago. I look back at the old records, and it was just wild that way back then, you know, it, it, the amount of time they dedicated and devoted to all these little things with all these different organizations, and they were part of all these boards and all these things. People don't do that anymore. You you yeah. see the guys because and back then, hundred years ago, it was like these New York lawyers during like the Great Depression. They were the people that ran the club, and they were doing all these sorts of things on the side all you know philanthropic you know social charitable for for political organizations whatever today you 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 don't see that i think those 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 communities have sort of died and it's really just work home work home and uh i think if you're just looking at an economic you know mindset it, it may make sense to you but in other senses it doesn't yeah yeah Susie Q said, because they propagated the patriarchy. Yeah, I, I won't get Will started on that because that could be in a whole other whole other hour long uh, podcast on that alone, uh, especially yes. with the content Will does. But uh, yeah. uh, Austin, it looked like you wanted to say something and then I wanted to move on to our next topic, but feel free yeah, to jump yeah, in if you have something. Thing about, you know, the community involvement thing. Um, we've lost that in this country. But so like I'm a member of the, my Elks Lodge where, you know, where I live. And, you know, because that's a, it's a, that's about community. We take care of our veterans. We take care of you know, um, needy children in the community. Those are things that are like really important. My parents have been members of the Elk Lodge for you know, the last four or five years. Um, and it's one of the best little community gatherings that I've been around because it's people who share your values, people who give back to their community. The, you know, they're talking about the consumer part of it and why the left has taken so much ground from, from the right or people who are apolitical. Um, you know, you got to be like a precinct committeeman. If you're a registered Republican, you got to put some 
some uh, some uh, time and, and your own tongue and cheek into the party. You got to show up at your school board meetings. You got to be involved in your homeowners association because everything there. Unfortunately, you know, we talk about, you know, culture drives our politics. Well, now politics is driving our culture, unfortunately. And so you've got to be involved in your PTA. You got to be involved in HOA. Got to be involved in like your local legislative district. Republican committee, your central, your county committee, all those things matter because it's starting to add up and the left has figured that out. And those little institutions have a lot of sway over our everyday lives. They've already taken over the big stuff, but you know, the, the bedrock, the nuts and bolts, the but bread and butter stuff that makes communities strong. Dads have got to be precinct committeemen. They've got to run for school board. They've got to be involved in the PTA. They've got to be involved in the church committee. They got to recruit people that are in their Bible studies with them to go knock doors on the weekends to find candidates that are godly men and women to run for office because um, nobody's really stepped up to do that because we've forgotten about that being a consumer society, the rat race at the bottom that Gavin was talking about. And so the community involvement is critical, you know, to, to establishing that very safe community and ultimately saving, you know, your state and your country. Well, for crying out loud, I mean, we have a giant uh, movement going on right now. Moms for Liberty. Right. Like, like where are, where's the dads, you know? And and honestly, a lot of it's because we need permission. Um, and Will, I know you do a lot of work on this. So um, Renaissance of Men for you who want to know more.